the symbolism of a fire pit obviously is that it's a place for storytelling so um, uh, if it were just a little warmer it would be perfect um, but thank you for coming uh, thank you Elizabeth Tess uh, Jennifer um, Tony mr. Uh, Tenorio thank you for all your efforts to bring me often when a writer is asked to speak it's about um, uh, his or her most recent project that's typical and when you just said this book is 30 years old it freaked me out because <laughs> um, I don't feel like the author of it uh, was that much younger than me um, I, I've stuck with a lot of the same approaches in my uh, storytelling that I found in Rolling Nowhere and um, uh, but you're right, it, it does um, presage various other, other things, and um, I've noticed that myself. Uh, it's an honor to be at the Dr. Martin Ortiz uh, fire pit because um, it's not a ski area fire pit, it's not a uh, campground fire pit, it's, uh, it's a hobo fire pit, a place you could um, stay warm with strangers who were hopefully becoming your friends. And some, I'm not sure any other culture has the same kind of mythology around hobos and riding the rails, but in America it's become a symbol of one of those democratic places where you can run into anybody, right? Like if you put yourself out there, anybody in the world might appear next to you to um, share a cup of coffee or a cigarette. And, uh, and so I, uh, I'm honored <clears throat> to speak in a in a place with that history, um, uh, Martin Ortiz and I came from very different places. He dropped out of school at age 13 and rode the rails with buddies for three and a half years doing farm work. <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the amazing parts of his story is how he then succeeded, though he was uh, in many ways alone in these places he ventured. Um, uh, my history is is different, but uh, the alone part of it is is also a factor. I'm from Denver, um, where feeling alone at school came as a result of a court order to desegregate. So I went to I'd been assigned to a white, mostly white high school that the court decided to desegregate through um, busing, and to do that, they took the mostly minority high school students and redistributed them. And they took a handful of white students to fill in some of the empty chairs at those formerly minority high schools. And, and I was one of those. Um, I, uh, I went with some trepidation because uh, my high school had a, a tough reputation. And, um, and part of the experience was, was rough. Um, uh, I was roughed up a little bit. My friends were roughed up a little bit. But there was a flip side, which was that as a, as a white person at those schools, you were something brand new. You weren't following in these well-worn tracks of being a jock or a freak or a, um, what else did we have? A druggie, we had druggies. Um, uh, you could be something brand new. You could, uh, you could be your own person in a lot of ways uh, that were pretty great. And for a long time, I thought that experience was sort of the main one that made me interested in riding the rails because it was my first experience of being um, in a minority group and my first experience of seeing what a difference that made and how the world looked. It changes everything. Um, and uh, some, I was in somebody else's social experiment, but I felt uh, it was benefiting me in some unexpected ways. I went from this high school to a small college in Massachusetts that Tess uh, also attended, um, where there were very few students from out west. And I remember thinking how amazing it was, because um, my roommates were from upstate New York and Boston. And whenever I had dinner with the one guy from Colorado that I knew in college, and I came back, they'd say, hey, you had dinner with Todd, didn't you? And I said, how do you know? And they said, because you're talking differently. Like, it changes your accent when you have dinner with Todd. And I thought, that's amazing. 
Um, and in the way things kind of do at school, it dovetailed with something that my anthropology professor said the next day, which was by way of explaining this idea of cultural relativism that everybody has an accent, right? We all think we don't have an accent, but that's just to ourselves, to the rest of the world who doesn't share our accent. We have one and um, we can't hear our own, but thinking you don't have an accent is like being one of those people who before Copernicus believed that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun rotated around us. It's the same sort of uh, level of realization uh, that we are one of many. I'd been thinking of majoring in philosophy, but anthropology quickly gained the upper hand. To me, it was philosophy as lived by real people. It was concerned not with thoughts swirling around in the heads of deceased thinkers so much as it was with the thoughts in the heads of people who lived in other places, who didn't write books, who hadn't even been considered to have culture until fairly recently. It was about how many different ways there are of seeing the world and of understanding experience. It was multidisciplinary. It was about internalizing the perspectives of other cultures, as my professor explained it, and respecting them. Anthropology, he said, and I actually kept this in my notes, was, quote, implacably opposed to insularity, constriction of thought, and the idea that God is on our side, as opposed to somebody else's. I was fascinated by the idea that anthropologists do field work. It reminded me of journalism, which I'd done in high school, but it was a lot deeper. Like anthropologists went for months, sometimes they went for years, they learned whole new languages so that they could understand other people. They called their research participant observation, a phrase that suggested that in order to learn about other people, you also had to pay attention to how you were seeing, to what kind of participant you were and how that mattered. Profoundly important to me was an idea expressed by a book my professor gave me, um, by a professor named James Bradley, that they <clears throat> that they know, those people out there, what you want to know, so you need to make them your teachers. I'd been uncomfortable with the feeling that my education seemed to be preparing me to assume some sort of privileged, entitled view of the world. And here were anthropologists telling me, you can learn from the lowest hobo. For me, there was almost a biblical appeal to that idea. The links to journalism were mostly in the back of my mind at this point. What appealed to me about participant observation was that it might be a way to conduct scholarly research and have a really great adventure at the same time. In particular, I was thinking about riding the rails and about hobos or tramps, people who did it professionally, about apprenticeship of a sort. I was curious about hobos, about their rootlessness and their backgrounds, and especially the American lore that associates a kind of freedom with the way they live. And I was curious about myself, whether I could really manage to live on and around freight trains. Formal education was important, as Martin Ortiz would attest, but I imagine he might have agreed that informal education mattered a lot as well. So yeah, as you heard, I proposed this as the topic of my thesis, and they said, that's against the law. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. Um, but what if I left college and took a lot of notes and came back? Would you let me use those notes? And um, my professors had to huddle. Um, but then they said, yeah, we'll look at the notes, and we'll, we'll consider that. And um, to their credit, they were, they were good for their word. And I left college and then I, um, I came back. But it wasn't just professors who doubted me. My housemate, a woman who had spent part of her elementary years at a uh, special school in the White House, um, and the rest at Miss Porter's school, laughed and said she doubted the hobos would even talk to somebody like me. But I'd done journalism and I was used to asking strangers questions. I thought they might. Um, I thought if you really immersed, if you just didn't come in, you know, if you didn't drive up in your car with all your clean clothes and um, 
smelling like college if you came up uh, like somebody who'd been living a different way uh, but was still interested in them I thought maybe I would be able to um, to talk to people and that's really all I needed to do was talk and spend time and hang out right that's really what it amounts to it's not an interview when you sit down by somebody's fire and ask for a cigarette it's something different and um, if you don't look like you're dangerous and you don't look like you're going to attract a lot of trouble, lots of times you can just sit down. So I rode the rails um, for five months all around the West. Five months is not so long, but it was a lot for me. Um, I started out first telling people I was really a college student, and then I realized most of them thought I was bragging that I was not really a college student, and so I just... Uh, dispensed with uh, trying to explain myself because I realized a lot of them didn't explain themselves and I had all these other habits from the world I came from like I thought when you meet people you look them in the eye and if you want to introduce yourself maybe you hold out your hand but if you're a hobo why would you want to shake this guy's hand what what, is, what, is, what does he want from me that he wants to shake my hand and he doesn't even know me so there's all these questions of body language and gestures that are inappropriate for the situation. Um, um, I'd say, hi, I'm Ted, and, and then they, they wouldn't say, hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm George. They'd just say, oh. And so you learn to be more slow about explaining yourself, who you are. You realize a lot of them use nicknames for themselves. You know, it's a version of, of homeless people or or punks of which, you know, all, there's all kinds of, of people around a big city, and this is kind of a version of that, the people you would meet on the rails. Um, they're often a little more high functioning than urban homeless people. They have the wherewithal to catch a train, to go somewhere else, and they actually often are looking for work. Um, but it's still, it's like an outsider group, and, um, and you have to fit in. I grew my hair and my beard, such as it is, I, I wore the sort of secondhand clothing they'd wear. The main problem was my age, though, because they were mostly older than me, and there's nothing I could do about that. Um, come on, iPad. Um, I made all kinds of mistakes. Uh, I set myself up for a few bad things to happen. I, I, um, I became what they call partners with two guys I met in, um, in Spokane. We went to North Dakota to look for work in the beet harvest. We went back to Haver, Montana and spent a few days. And we went back to Spokane and I agreed to work in a um, St. Vincent de Paul store for a couple of days because they would give you a bedroll. And one of the guys I was with, he was old, he had this infected hand, and he, uh, he needed a better bedroll. And uh, the second day of work, I brought home the bedroll to this vacant lot where we had camped out near some warehouses in, in Spokane and realized that um, some things were missing from the pack, the, the knapsack I had left there. And this is... This is something, you know, it's one of those rules of the road. You never go through your partner's pack. And part of me was afraid to bring it up, but another part knew that I had to, because if I didn't, who knows what would happen next. And um, these two guys, one was old and feeble, the other was young and powerful uh, physically and we had been looking at a newspaper feature on a, a supermax prison in Marion, is it Illinois or Indiana? Um, and he knew a bunch of the prisoners in these pictures. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, what have I gotten myself into? Anyway, um, he's the one who I got in a big argument with. Um, Believe it or not, I was carrying in my pocket this little container of self-defense spray that my mother had given me. 
And when I put my hand in my pocket because I thought this guy baby was going to hit me, he thought I had a gun or a knife, which was the most fantastic mistake ever. And, um, and he said he had one too, um, uh, but he didn't, uh, it wasn't worth it to, um, uh, to, to go to the next step with me. And he and Pete just left. And this friendship I'd been, well, I thought it was a friendship, I'd been working on it for a couple of weeks, just uh, disintegrated and um, uh, it's funny, you know, it's like, sure, it's an experiment, but you live in a way like this, you immerse deeply enough and it's your life. It's how, it's how you're living and it's not a game. You feel it deeply and, uh, and you feel pretty bad when things go wrong. It's only later like weeks and months later that you understand if you're a writer trouble is always interesting and trouble is unless it's really bad trouble it's its own reward right it's a version of a journalist writing the news the news is about bad things happening usually and and if you're writing about your experiences that's a consolation when when things go bad is um uh it'll be interesting to read about. Um, so a lot of the guys I met were white and they had a hierarchy which put, um, they call it, they usually said they were tramps if they traveled and worked, they were hobos if they traveled and didn't work, and they were bums if they didn't do either, okay? So bums were, were neither one. But I was noticing that um, there are a lot of Mexicans riding freight trains and I said so those are tramps right because they're traveling and they're working and the guys I was with said what are you talking about they're Mexicans and I said okay but they're tramps they're like the original tramps immigrants traveling to work come from another country that, and they said no they're Mexicans and I thought whoa this is pretty extreme and it opened my eyes to the fact that the guys I was with were like the last dwindling generation of that depression era hobo and and the next story was um, migrants from the south and they were the ones gonna make the big difference and because my um, Denver, pa Denver Public School Spanish was passable at that point I was able to um, uh, speak to some guys I met on freights. I remember in um, Bakersfield getting off a freight one afternoon and when you get off a train you always look to see who else got off and who's been on the who's been on that ride with you. There's one other guy um, uh, his name was, in, this is hard, still hard for me to say, Enrique Jarra um, and uh, he was heading for the rescue mission and you know, you, you start with, como estas? Donde vas? Que vamos a hacer? Tienes hambre? All that stuff. And, um, and to my amazement, he, he, uh, he didn't mind hanging out with me. In fact, he thought I was a freak to, uh, to be a, an American guy who's, who spoke some Spanish. And it made me think there's a, there's a really important book to be written here. There's many important books to be written, but Maybe there's another one which someday I could write about um, the newer wave of hobos. And um, uh, when the whole thing was over and Rolling Nowhere came out and a few people liked it, I found that, um, yeah, I could go, tr go do this again. And that, as Tess told you, that, um, did you tell them? I don't know if you did. That became my second book. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, some people think that because a person like me calls himself a writer, it, I, I find it very easy to write, and in fact I don't. I find it about the hardest thing I can do, but it's also the thing I can do that most lets me um, uh, be as good as I can be. Like I'm not held back when I'm writing, I can, uh, I'm only limited by my own uh, my own inspiration 
but writing is hard. And another thing that's hard is this kind of research which you do in all kinds of documentary work when you go out there, because almost always you go by yourself. Um, uh, there's a wonderful writer for The New Yorker named Susan Orlean, whose most favorite, uh, famous book is called The Orchid Thief, which was the basis of that movie adaptation. Some of you have probably seen that. Anyway, she, uh, she was asked once if the kind of research she had to do was ever awkward, and she said, yes, and here's a quote, and it can be really lonely Everybody's nightmare is being the complete odd one out. When I was working on another book, I saw a survey in which Americans were asked what activities they feared the most. First was swimming, and second was going to a party with strangers. I thought, that's what I do. But things that are difficult to do are often interesting to read about, and that's always been a spur to me to keep going, to hang in there despite discomfort or loneliness. And um, I believe my strat strategy in that book, which was as an American amidst Mexicans, was in a way replicating in miniature the anxieties my country has about the Mexicans among us, especially other parts of the country. In my book, I'd be able to respond to that honestly and pull readers along who otherwise would never want to read a book about unofficial immigration. So in books since Rolling Nowhere, I've lived several different lives. As you heard, I spent a year working as a correction officer, and most recently I became a USDA meat inspector, a federal meat inspector, so that I could write about a Nebraska beef slaughterhouse and the kinds of people who work there. Um, each of my projects has tested my identity in one way or another. You can't live with people 24 hours a day for months on end without being profoundly affected. It's impossible. Um, this is due to how influenced we are by the company we keep. Every human being wants to be accepted, feel like we belong. My speech changes when I'm live, not just when I'm with Todd, but when I'm living with uh, when I'm working every day with my fellow meat inspectors, um, uh, when I'm working in a prison, I pick up a different way of talking. Um, I think no lesson I've had prepared me like one, though, that I learned a month into my hobo travels. I was near the freight yards in Haver, Montana, when a hobo just into town looked at me and asked, are you a tramp? Uh, yeah, I stammered and realized at the moment, at that moment, that the degree to which, I realized at that moment, the degree to which saying it made it so. I'd begun to feel like a tramp, begun to wear my clothes more naturally, and in terms of acceptance, that really made all the difference. Anybody who's snuck underage into a bar or any other place they weren't supposed to be knows how powerful it is to look comfortable, right? to look like you belong there. And there's no way to look like you belong, like feeling like you belong. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. I like to think experiences that stretch your identity, that make you think about somebody else for a while and how they live, make you a bigger person. Um, I think almost always they do. I'm not sure everything about working in a prison made me a bigger person. I think some parts of that shrunk me, but um, overall I kind of think that when I do one of these things, it's like I'm a rubber band and it get, I get stretched and when I'm done, the rubber band goes back but not completely, right? You know how rubber bands don't. And um, I, I, uh, I think all of us can become a bit bigger in a good way by leaving our own circles for a while, taking some social chances, um, and using our brains every step of the way. Thanks for listening and um, for shivering out here with me. Questions? Um, and really, if you're cold, get closer to the fire. I, we don't have to sit in chairs, um, and I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has some. Yes, back there. Could you uh, search it, things you did affected how it affected your language? 
it ever affect how much you cursed? How much I cursed? Probably. <laughs> I think probably. Was there a particular word you were interested in? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You know, I swear a lot. Yeah, so it's funny. Um, I'd been living in Mexico for about three months in a little village where some guys I met in Arizona were from. I went home with them when the orchards where they worked uh, got rained out. And um, I met uh, an American guy in Mexico City and we went to a restaurant and he heard me order and he said, you sound like a campesino. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, just your whole accent. It, it, it sounds like you're not from Mexico City. And um, I had no idea about that. I did know that I had had to learn about 20 different forms of the verb chingar, uh, which they had not taught me in school. And um, if you master those, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, <laughs> Or so it seemed to me. In your writing, there's a vernacular you adjusted to your character. Like, do, I do, do I use vernacular? Yeah, all the time. I do. I do. You know, it's um, the best way is to use it and, and, and so you're not self-conscious because you, you just want it to be the way you talk. And a, sometimes the hard part about writing is getting back in that frame of mind and, and thinking how you used to talk. I write as many notes as I can, uh, sometimes by hand, and I keep them in my back pocket here, in my front pocket here, a little notebook. But then when I have a computer, I'll type them out. I'll, I'll expand these short notes so that, to their maximum length so that I have the most possible information. And my goal at the end is, uh, sometimes I think of it like I'm assembling a big pile of clay like big and unformed and um, the more I have to work with the more are the opportunities to make something nice out of it right by by cutting away that extra and hopefully when you get to the end it's there's something appealing and maybe even artistic about it but I don't want to make any grand claims <laughs> so when you knew that you were going to leave school to take notes That's a really, really good question. Could you hear her question? Okay. Yeah, so... No. <laughs> um, my professors were very clear that my thesis had to be in the third person, which I don't know if anthropologists would say that today. I don't think so. But um, my professors said, you're not in this. You're not a, a character in this story. They did let me include a short chapter about my field experience at the end. Um, and then an, I wrote an article for a student magazine I worked on just about one morning with one hobo, kind of as an experiment, because it hadn't fit in my thesis, but it was really interesting. And also because when you have a strange experience like that, people want to know what it was like but they particular, if they're your friends, they want to know what it's like for you, right? What was it like for you to, how did you fit in? Weren't you scared? Because you're their way in. You're the way they're going to understand it. And um, so to write that article was to be able to talk to my friends in a way, not to my professors. It was more like I could speak in a, it felt to me like a more natural voice. And... Um, and I like doing that a lot. And it seemed like a really good strategy uh, for getting my experience out there. And um, it's, it's a strange story how that article I wrote was picked up by the alumni magazine and then seen by a wire service reporter. And then I got a phone call one morning and I was sure it was a friend giving me a hard time because she was pretending to be from the Today Show and, and would, I, would I come down tomorrow? And I said, who is this? And, uh, 
and she she swore she was not my friend. She worked for the Today Show, <laughs> and, um, and that's when I thought, wow, maybe I actually could write a whole book. It sort of dawned on me slowly, Tess. Like I didn't know anyone who'd written a book other than an academic kind of book, so. It, it, at a certain point, I thought, I guess I should try. And, uh, but I don't think I believed that from the beginning, because who writes books? <laughs> apart, apart from a few people around here, yeah, yes. So I'm curious how your experience of home shifts when you do this participant observation immersion, and yeah. if you can go back to when you went back to school, how your experience of being a college student, if it did shift, how? And then when you go home and you're a different, an altered person or expanded person and you're going back to where people that you love haven't had that same experience, right? what's that kind of re-immersion yeah. like? No, it's a really important question because you need you've been dreaming of home and you want to go back there and yet you have so much explaining to do that is difficult past a certain point and um, uh, it's always only a partial return to home you never I've never felt the same going back I've always been glad I had a home to go to but I think each time I've done this, I've like I felt further from my parents' version of home. But then there's another version of home which you make yourself as a grown-up, right? And that having that version of home, which sometimes amounts to a person you um, are close to, and sometimes that version of home has to. I sometimes feel that has to be there for me to go do that scary thing. Like I couldn't do it if I didn't have somebody who was at least gonna ask me, well, weren't you scared? I was scared for you. Like that, um, that makes it possible. So it's a, it's a weird tension between knowing you'll never be able to explain and you won't be the same, especially if it's been a bit traumatic like working in the prison was. Um, and then just being grateful that there's a place you can go where they think they know you. But how, it's so different just in the 30 years that you've been doing this, so it was much easier to not stay in contact with what was home 30 years ago, but now, oh, yeah. like how do you find that balance between finding a new place and kind of letting go what you think you know, but still staying in contact with, like, how do you do that? Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I, I don't feel I'm an expert. And um, so I have kids now, as you know. And for my most recent book about roads, I didn't want to be gone from home for more than a month or two at, at the most. So sometimes I made two trips so that I wouldn't have to be gone too long. So it changes as you move through life. You, you know, I um, I wouldn't want to ride the rails for four months straight with my kids at home. That wouldn't that wouldn't feel right. Um, on the other hand, cool things happen. Like um, a couple of you know my my son, who's now uh, twenty, finally read Rolling Nowhere a couple years ago. And uh, I'd been dreading this moment because I was afraid he might want to ride the rails himself. And sure enough, that's what he asked me. He said, Does, since you did that, can I do it? And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do it. But um, how about I go with you? And I thought he was going to say, forget it. Like, that's not the same. But he said, OK. And um, so we took a trip. It was only about five days, but, um, and I was terrified the whole time something was going to happen to him. But that's the thing. 
you know, you change, and that's that's what the rails are for me now. And um, they're still uncomfortable, and they still you get dirty. And after the fifth day, I was I was glad that he had had enough because I had to. <laughs> I read that, yeah. yeah. And uh, so when he went on the, on the road, on the rail, uh, he learned how to read, he learned how to speak, just listening to the stories and that type of thing. He learned how to deal with people, uh, that type of thing. Uh, and he always you know, used that as an example of things he learned yeah. that were important to him. What were some of those things? Huh. No, it's true that um, there's something uh, cool about how good a seat you get on that train depends on how smart you are in looking for it, right? Like you know what kind of train to jump, you know what kind of car on that train has the best ride, you know how to stay out of the wind, because if you're at the front of the car it's going to be cold, and and so your comfort will depend not on how wealthy you are or how connected, but on your wits, right? And if you stay safe, that's going to depend on your wits. So it's a good kind of education, and um, um, I'm glad to hear he thought of it that way, too. It, it sounds like he um, became more worldly. Um, it's not guaranteed that that'll happen, right? Bad things can happen, too. You can meet up with the wrong characters, but. But all through life, you might meet up with the wrong characters, and you've got to decide who you should hang out with, and uh, when to walk away, and you know when to offer a, uh, an olive branch or whatever. Uh, so no, for for me, it was a good part of growing up, and I had spent until then my whole life in school. Unlike Martin, well, I guess well he was much younger, but I'd known nothing but school, and I thought. If I stick it, if I continue at this rate, I'm going to graduate, never having lived in, as anything other than a student. So I think it's it's good to have a mix in your life of of kinds of education, and uh, and this was a good kind for me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, no, I've maintained several, and it's the rise of the internet, which didn't exist for when I was writing my first three books, has really made it possible, as everybody here already knows, to stay in touch more than you could. So, in my book about Sing Sing, I write about this one really interesting prisoner who. Um, Instead of pornography on his cell walls, uh, he's African American. Instead of like naked white women, he had clothed African American women. And I thought, wow, you're different. And uh, <laughs> and he was uh, really concerned with educating himself. And he he just loved to get into these long conversations about the immorality of planning for prisons to be built 20 years from now. Because if you're building a prison, if you're planning a prison that you're not going to build for 20 years, you're planning for, for people who are children right now. And you could instead decide you're not going to spend money putting them in a prison, you're going to spend money on their school, for example. So he's a really thoughtful guy. And I, there's probably six pages of my book about him. A year ago, I get a Facebook message from him. <laughs> oh, it blew me away. He's um. <laughs> He was in, it was his third prison bid, it was for murder, but he was paroled. In fact, he would have been paroled much earlier, except he's a, he smokes a lot of weed, and they, that's a very cheap drug test they can give in prison, and um, he would just get busted continually, and that extended his sentence. But he was out, he asked if he could come to my class someday, and he came. and. Uh, <coughs> And um, it was it was great because 
our relationship till then had been defined by the different colors of our uniforms and without those colors we could be more like human beings and uh, um, it was pretty wonderful. There have been a couple other uh, connections with the past. Um, uh, my book Coyotes, um, uh, the son of one of the guys I traveled with who grew up in southern Colorado um, read about his his dad who he didn't otherwise know in my book and wrote me and we exchanged many emails about that and then another guy I traveled with had a son and sent me a picture of the two of them from Texas they were still migrating and um, uh, oh gosh another guy I, I traveled with actually to Los Angeles from Phoenix lost his arm he's from uh, Iguala in um, Guerrero State and uh, he lost his arm in a factory in LA he went back to Iguala and uh, um, he wrote me letters for three or four years so I, I really like it when I can do that it doesn't always happen but you you want it to because you you want to think the people in your books aren't just data points right <laughs> So I like I like to stay in touch. Yeah. Yes, back there. Yeah, so it took me a long time to realize I should never sit down to a blank sheet of paper or a new document without some idea of what I was going to put on it. Like that's to me that is a formula for disaster because you, you you get all tied up staring at nothingness right so I always um, I'll take a walk you know I'll I'll, um, I'll write some emails and get my mind flowing or um, sometimes I take a shower in my mind because ideas come together so I, I usually just think you need to spend some time thinking before you start writing and that then becomes your pattern like if you know you're gonna have to write this long thing that's gonna take you however many hours you know plan to do an hour a day for the next four days and and then your mind gets ready for it each time that that hour and and you can be more productive I think like when I get out of the groove it's harder to get back in but then when I'm in I can I can really produce uh, effectively if I stick to some kind of pattern. So, you, you, everybody's different, but that's how I work. Yeah, Tess. Um, I remember in that Rob Morton interview, you said that it frustrates your editors that you take a long time between books, so they need to keep you in that your whole cabinet. I relate because I'm like really have to like give me the file on these things before I can even get into the new things. So I'm just sort of wondering, you know, you have that full of ideas or you have you know encountered something on the road or whatever how does something percolate up to become the project you know one of these five magical projects yeah that you, do? you know often the idea comes from talking with my friends <clears throat> um, and my friend will say that would be so interesting to read about and I've never been sure it would um, so I like to think I have this perfect internal gyroscope that unerringly guides me towards success but um, I don't and I, uh, I have many <clears throat> projects that stalled and went nowhere and um, uh, so sometimes you know and sometimes it's just a bit of luck and uh, I just decided last week, um, my most recent article was about um, comparing uh, Guantanamo with American Supermax prisons for Vanity Fair magazine. And when you, when you go to Guantanamo, you have all these interesting experiences that don't always fit into an article. So I want to write the article about all those interesting experiences that um, I didn't get to put into the article, if you see what I'm saying. So, um, in fact, 
this weekend, I was staying with friends and they had a teenage girl who was really interested in doing different styles to her hair. Like there's a, some websites all about the latest thing to do with your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, oh, our press guide at Guantanamo had this perfect, this like incredible perfect bun and we were standing next to Camp X-Ray which is this notorious abandoned camp from the war on terror. And the photographer I was with said, can you show us how you do that to your hair? And so you're near this symbol of international tyranny and a real bubbly kind of cute, nice soldier says, yeah, sure. And takes off her hat and, and lets her hair down. And it's like three feet long. And it's like unbelievable. She's, it was just fantastic, and, and it took about five minutes, and she got it just right. And um, and this this girl whose house I was visiting um, asked if it was like uh, Kristen Stewart's hair in that movie Camp X-Ray, and it was. It's exactly the same. Like they got it perfect, and um, there's something kind of. I think worth writing about because Guantanamo is all human rights abuse and horror, but there's all these human, weird human stories around it that um, uh, I think it's time I wrote something about. So let's do one more question and then people can get closer to the fire so we don't huh. freak anybody out. So does anyone want to ask one more question at the group and then we can have more casual conversation? And hot chocolate? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> that, that's fine. As, as a, just on that last note, one of the things you have to be able to do to succeed as any kind of writer or journalist, I think, is be willing to ask questions that reveal yourself as not fully informed. And, um, uh, I think I've gotten better at doing that than anything else, at, at being willing to sound stupid uh, <laughs> so that I can learn something. So don't, don't ever be afraid to ask a question you really are interested in the answer to. And we can do it around the fire with hot chocolate. <laughs>